Hi everyone, uh, welcome back to our so uh, Feast for Crows uh, reread. I'm sorry I'm dark, I'm not going through goth. Um, but yeah, I already asked for Dusky Woman. I've already forgotten. Tyrek <laughs> Lannister and High Septon Theories. Um, I'm here, of course, with the lovely Claire Gray. Hi, Claire. Hi. So uh, today we are discussing the chapters from 25 to 29, which is Brienne 5 to the Reaver, which is Victorion. And uh, I, I already said, like, I loved Brienne so much that the others just didn't do it for me after this week. I was just like, oh, God, I have to go through all of them now. And Brienne was like the best this week. Um, next week, we'll be reading from 30 to 34. It's a good set next week. We've got two Jamie chapters next week. It's Jamie 4 to Cat of the Canals. Um, and we already get to meet Cat of the Canals this week, actually. Um, my theme for this week's set of reading is don't overestimate the power of belief um mm. which is going to come up a lot i do want to ask actually before i start um uh, i was in johnny's live stream last night which was really interesting and johnny i mentioned that i went to iceland to visit where they shot the veil and you asked for pictures so i was thinking maybe of doing a live stream where I talk through the film locations and maybe show some pictures with like some shots from the show. That if you're interested brilliant. in that, let me know in the comments down below and I could do it some weekend too. So um, yeah, if that's just, like, just, <laughs> it'll probably be just me answering questions if you have any questions about visiting the different locations. Um, all right, so yeah, don't overestimate the power of belief. So we had um, Brienne Five and like religion came up in every single chapter this week um mm. maybe with the exception of jamie mm. mm -hmm. but um other than that that religion was a strong theme this week i felt um how did what did you think of this week's reading i thought well it was interesting that stoneheart comes up a couple of times like the mention of like yeah. you know she's actually named stoneheart this woman so uh, there's the just from a reader's point of view, the, the the there's kind of hype around around this character before we meet her, um, and uh, yeah, just how it's it's a very um, <laughs> if you were going to say one of the books in the series was the kind of representation of feminism or certainly has a, a kind of feminist stance it's definitely this book for sure for sure yeah. yeah um and this chapter in particular this brain chapter uh it certainly shows how difficult it is for women between um heil and uh randall um uh, god brain has just got her work cut out for her here and mm -hmm. uh, be, be taken seriously uh yeah I, I there's a couple of things that i I don't want to spend too much time talking about separate to Brienne. There's a lot of, um, this is where a lot of conspiracy theories start to creep in. Yes. Brienne's yeah. story. And it's very, very easy to see in in these clutch of chapters. Oh, that's where that theory comes from. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's where that comes from. Yeah. Yeah. So here, the, the I mean, I'm kind of skipping into the chapter a little bit, but when Randall, I think it's when Randall banishes her, um they pass a ship called the titan's daughter yes. in the port which is of course the ship that took aria to bravos um this may all, so there there may be forces of the faceless men on this ship there i know that there has been suggested i think it could be preston jacobs again who suggested that there may be iron bank connections here and that and I, it did make me wonder how has randall tarley managed to rebuild maidenpool in a time that's so economically unstable for the rest of westeros mm. so there may it may be that he has borrowed money from yeah. bravosi uh, forces uh 
now the Titan Sorter could be anywhere at any time. That's that's true, but it is interesting that it, it comes up again here. Um, mm. I'm not sure if you ever came across that theory before. No, not the. <clears throat> to me, it was just on the surface, like kind of like oh, another near miss for Brienne, mm. or another near miss for Arya, because we had that sense, obviously, um, the, the the readers experience of that real near miss at uh with the red wedding yes and she but was there with far, Sandra. how long is this now between aria arriving and bravos it's, it's a few months right well i don't know i mean timeline i always get completely confused about yeah. the timeline the titan's daughter could have been could have taken aria to bravos been back been there and back like you know across the narrow sea a few times and it just so happened that it was mentioned but I don't know. I got. I get the sense that it was mentioned leaving the docks because she, just, you know, Aria was on that ship and she just missed. She just missed her. Yeah, I wasn't sure because um, there are a few timelines out there that put Sam's mm. chapter like chronological with Brienne's. So yeah, it means that the Titan's daughter is over and back. Um, it does uh, yeah. mean that it's if either way there's there's some sort of connection there that we're supposed to pay attention yes. to and yeah. um, that the, the bravosi even when sam is in bravos and he thinks it's very foreign there is like there are a lot of influences there there's a mm -hmm. lot of um like it's i guess the equivalent of france and london right that the, this kind of it's that kind of close proximity, yeah right yeah it's not that far um uh, Ion says, Titan of Bravos is a mecha robot that fights dragons. Yep, I believe. <laughs> <laughs> um, and Mackenzie, thank you so much for coming along. Uh, yeah, I'm going to get in, Bob, I'm going to save your theories on the Dusky Woman for when we get to her because mm -hmm. uh, you have some interesting points there. Um, yeah, so uh, I, I don't, I'm not really sure where to start with Bri Brienne. I do have one question. Um, Heil Hunt, is there something, I mean, it's easy to be sceptical, but is there something developing here between Heil Hunt and Brienne? Is this kind of like a, I, I kept thinking of Molly Ringwald in um, The Breakfast Club, where she ends up with the bully. Oh, um, maybe, I mean, I don't think he makes it anyway, does he? And I can't well, remember yeah. anything really he, developing between them. He's disfigured, his face is disfigured disfigured do we know if he's dead uh i think does isn't uh, later on i don't think he gets out of the situation with um Lady when they run into stoneheart okay. i think i think he's gone and I'm not so sure about pod i think brienne survives but um i think he's just i think he's another example of how competent tarly is in that he's not going to let a highborn lady just roam around playing mm. at being a knight and he wants yeah. to make sure that somebody's following her and can take take her safely back to her father at evenfall so I, somebody who lets her do all the fighting anyway yeah yeah or just i don't know i mean maybe there's some financial gain in it for him or but i think he's there not of his own volition he's definitely mm -hmm. there as a pair of eyes for for tarly and like maybe he will because i get the sense that he's just sort of sat around observing her he's not like i'm here to you know help with this or the you know or drag you back or whatever he just seems to be there kind of keeping an eye on her to uh, until she does a particular thing and then he'll either pull her out of it or he'll kill her or whatever it was he's been sent to do but <clears throat> to me he's just a, a kind of a, a, a sort of representative of tarly you know on earth that kind of he's a he's a manifestation of tarly really just keeping an eye on her it is a massive red flag in hindsight which george is great at doing this it's a massive red flag that this, I believe this is the first time Stoneheart is mentioned by name. I don't yes. remember her being mentioned before, mm -hmm. um, but she's mentioned by name in this chapter. It's also the chapter where Septon Marybald comes and gives mm -hmm. that top three speeches from the series. 
Yeah, I think he, um, he's one of my favorite and probably a lot of Definitely. the fan base is one, you know, favorite kind of secondary character. And the, he does seem to come with a big, with a lot of significance, a lot of symbolism. There's also, when we're talking about, oh yeah, you can see how theories are born from, from this particular piece of the text. You get that a lot with Meribald, and you also get that quite a bit with the High Septon. Both of them seem to be the, <clears throat> there's this like, oh, there seems to be a very convenient place for s certain characters to hide or certain, you know, um, I mean, Meribald goes into, you know, just the description of, um, We've had a very rich description so far of the houses and the sigils and the history and the backgrounds of the highborn, like, you know, the kind of landed gentry and the history of the monarchy. But we get to find out through the eyes of Septon Meribold, who can't even read or write. So he's very, um, you know, he uses everything that he's got to be able to kind of work his way around his shortcomings to be able to like fulfill his his kind of mission but you get a huge sense from through his eyes about that layer underneath the small folk the 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 masses and we get to find out that there are places in Westeros that are too small to e even have a name yeah. so these tiny little villages that he's going around to visit and immediately you think, well, okay, that would be a perfect place for somebody to hide, where there's like some sort of kind of infrastructure there, a village, a small village, where there'll be some resources where you can get food and shelter and the basics or whatever, but it's so small, it doesn't even have a name. Fine places for men to hide. You've got to ask yourself as a reader, hmm, who could hide somewhere like that? Yeah. And then... You also get again equally with the High Septon in, in Cersei's chapter, where Tenor uh, Merriweather says, Oh, yeah, what well, that's, you know, this strange custom of the High Septon not having a name. It's just the High Septon. Um, you know, and Cersei explains, Well, if you, you know, you can dig around a little bit and find out exactly what that particular High Septon's name is, but it tends to be, Oh, the fat one, or the one before the fat one, or, you know, the one with the big feet or the one you know you, it's more of a description and it just again it's so easy to immediately think <clears throat> okay that's an easy place for somebody to hide again their identity whether it's location or within a certain position or you know and it's just this it's there are layers and there's so much woven in and i think we get a huge sense of this so i think this is this is probably why this book in particular, A Feast for Crows, is a favourite amongst yeah. theorists in, in the fandom because it's just littered with these little nuggets that, that just beg for you to think, could that be? No, that, that would be a really good place for dot, dot, dot. And then there's that, well, or is it just, is it just the prose? Is it just a description of something? It's very... I think this is, and Sam's chapter, I think, points this out quite clearly. There's a, this is where things really start to change for a lot of the characters. There's a real flip to what happens to them next. So we've described, we've said in the last couple of weeks, oh, this is Arya's seminal chapter, or this is Sam, Cersei's seminal, ch seminal chapter. And they are, they are very, they're all contained within this book, these well seminal chapters so these are the chapters where things change for that character from here on in um and i remember having this discussion a couple of years ago particularly about the sam chapter i know we'll get to it but um just about where it's placed and the description of what's going on in that chapter seems very it's almost like the author has gone right this is about midway in the story Oh, I can't hear you. Oh, I put myself on mute, sorry. Um, I And Johnny said he's gonna do that stream with me. So that's great. Thanks, Johnny. Um, so it's interesting what you said there about the village because 
we've talked a lot about loving Brienne and Sam chapters for the re and Arya chapters because they show you places no one else like Cersei can't show you anywhere. She can show you a history you haven't seen, but she can't show you a location in Westeros because she can't go anywhere. Um, and even Jamie is limited in what he gets to see. But yeah, you're right. Septon, the Septon here has shown us a lot. And it's funny as a fandom, we become like obsessed with looking for people hiding in plain sight or people um, hiding undercover within an institution of some sort. And like this is kind of George almost stepping in with, uh, with his pacifist anti-war speech through Marybold, also going, by the way, a character could be anywhere. And if I need to, I'm going to use that. <laughs> and I'm OK with that. Like those little women coming out and getting the oranges. Oh, one of them could be Joanna Lannister. Who knows? Just, like, <laughs> I mean, is there? I don't know. I've never written a book and I wouldn't know how to start. But I just think there are certain things that pull the reader into a particular direction. And in, a, and in a, a, a story with a series this huge and descriptive and expansive, we do spend a particular amount of time with Marybald and his background yes. and his observations. And it's, I don't know, I mean, is it because it's just trying to enrich in the story and, and, and it, it's introducing you to another perspective of seeing things through the small folks eyes much more um so it's kind of opening a world building point of view it's opening opening the world a bit a bit more to, for the reader or is it is this guy somebody significant i mean he basically talks about the the, the broken man speech and yes. the the broke you know broken men and are not outlaws and that they deserve pity and then it's kind of revealed that you know it's quite obvious Brienne kind of guesses that he was a broken man and it he kind of reflects on the war of the nine penny kings which he was obviously involved in and he's like oh what oh what a war it was he kind of says enigmatically which immediately as a reader makes you think you were somebody significant Yes. you're hiding in this person and it just it does it drives you crazy where you just end up thinking that whole you know there's that that it just it just gets ridiculous where it's a, a case of the, the entire fandom so oh, that's a secret tag that's a secret to everyone everyone's a secret tag well, and it, it just but oh i don't know it drives me crazy who's it's, who <laughs> it's, it's interesting the broken man speech because um he says as well about that war that he was involved in that he never saw any he never saw a king and he never saw a penny from mm -hmm. that war mm -hmm. and uh if you think about it like he was he slept around he used his position to take the maidenhoods of several young ladies uh, very kind of similar in his partying um uh kind of lustful maybe youth it's a bit similar to other characters we've seen like Robert Baratheon, damp hair a little bit like, you know, just kind of mm. self-indulgent. Um, and they ended up broken men because they, I mean, damp hair ended up broken man for, for several reasons. Mm. But both of them in a way don't face up to um, the reality of their situation. And yeah. maybe perhaps the wrongdoing they have done, but also the wrongdoing that has been committed against them. Whereas Marybald is very much aware of that. He's also mm. aware of the effects, the, the, the effects these kind of global politics have locally. And, and even local politics have even more locally. Like these people mm. don't seem to have, like Randall Tarley has probably never even been around there. You know, there's probably mm. loads of like, liege lords that have never gone to that area and know mm -hmm. those people it's it, it makes me wonder what will happen when the others come down and will these people be able to hide will there be will they do they have survival skills that will go underestimated uh, he says that all these that nobody goes there because all they have is are, are stones and shells basically Mm. which I thought was an interesting 
think of stones and shells, they kind of relate to prehistory almost. Yeah. Right? Yeah. There's yeah. a survival there. There's a toughness there. Um, that, yeah, like it, it's, it was, it's an interesting uh, speech, but it's also an interesting place where he gives it. Mm. Um, yeah. I'm not really sure. There was something else that I was going to say now, and I, it's gone completely out of my head. It reminded me. Oh, actually, yes, I know what it reminded me of. There was a story in the, I can't remember if it was the 1950s. It could have been earlier. The um, This village was found in Siberia. I don't know if you heard of this. No. And they believed, it was. I think it was after World War II, and they still believed that the Tsar was the king. They still mm. believed that the, like, the Russian Revolution was gone yeah. 50 years or something. Yeah. And they 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 still had like the poster of the czar, still mm. worshipped it. They were in the middle of nowhere. Mm. Like they didn't have any access to the outside world. And people just happened upon them. They didn't know they they didn't know anything about World War One or World War Two. <laughs> um so they were completely they didn't know about air tra- travel, nothing. Wow. This little vi- village in the middle of Siberia. And but that reminded not, me of that. Yeah, yeah. It, it it's and there's lots of different possibilities with that. Just that notion that you know, how do they get their religion? And it would only be by people like Septim yeah, Septim yeah. Maribald. And if there are, what about all those places that he can't get to? You know, the the villages that are even because he has this sort of regular circuit. But that's just him. He's he's not able to serve all of those small unnamed villages everywhere in Westeros. So if that information and communication doesn't get to them from kind of transient people coming and going and travelers through the village, then is it going to be easier? Is it going to be easier for them to? to who do they worship? And would it be easier for them to accept the Red God, for example, or? Yeah. ice magic or what you know who knows who knows well i think it'll probably go back to your old gods thing as well because mm. he says to they have this kind of theological discussion about the nature of the seven gods and he says that each of the seven gods are they're multifaceted faceted in and of themselves yes there like are a many rainbow. interpretations of the one god <laughs> Yes. And that to me sounds more like an old god idea than yeah. like the seven gods. And it comes up in the High Septons, the meeting with Cersei later mm. on. There's no, this is a big problem with Westeros. There, there's no central theological discussion mm. or a center of theology. It should be the Citadel, but it's not the Citadel. The Citadel don't seem to be hammering out the finer details of the theology of the seven. There doesn't seem to be any discussion of that. Unlike, you know, somewhere like Rome or in our own world or mm. like institute, like educational institutions or great churches or cathedrals where you'd have yeah. theological work, even through the early Middle Ages, early mm. theologians. But here, the, the, like it seems to be open to interpretation. And that it, seems oh, that just, sounds very dangerous. There's so many things about this. There is he describes this concept of the one God with the seven aspects, and as you've said, the multifaceted, which immediately just makes you think of all the shards of light, the multifaceted shards of light that come from the rainbow, which again is associated with the seven. But one God with several aspects sounds very much like the many faced God. Yep. So, yep. you know, there's another kind of whole cluster of theories that can be born from that. But it's this idea that I think most of us just go, oh, yeah, OK. It's it was introduced as a separate seven gods because it's too difficult for people to understand. Is it? Is it really that difficult? There's one theory is you've got one god and there are seven aspects to that God, yes. but it's one God, okay? Understand. The other concept is this God actually is made up of seven other kind of prophets, lesser gods. Actually, that to me sounds more complicated. 
and and more of a difficult concept for the small folk to grasp so what you know there's just I, things I, that i think we take for granted as like oh yeah I the small remember. folk wouldn't wouldn't get that why wouldn't they get that i remember when i was at school uh and we were being taught catechism and uh, <laughs> we came home and we just done the trinity you know yeah. and the mystery of the trinity in the catholic church and all that kind of thing and i came home to my mom and i was like oh holy we just ghost did, we just did the mystery of the trinity you know the son the holy ghost and the father and yeah. are one you know and uh my mother was like yes it's a mystery it's a sacred mystery i was like it's not really a mystery ma i get it i know what they're on about she's like, no you don't get it you never get it like, okay. it's a mystery you know you know i went to a catholic school up until the well infant school and junior school part way and then I, when i moved moved house when i was younger and and ended up in a different school and suddenly a different faith weirdly but um my first set of rosary beads when i was when i was a little girl were glow in the dark rosary oh. rosary beads how cool is that, that is <laughs> so that oh. you can so that you can worry them while you're all you're in sat in the dark <laughs> oh my god but it again maybe that would have kept me in the church <laughs> <laughs> But I can, the, the, this concept of, his description of, oh, you know, the, the the cobbler is just an aspect. So again, you've got these seven gods that are aspects of, seven aspects of one god. Um, then of those gods, or those representatives, the mother, the stranger, the, the smith, you've got individual characters or things that represent you you and me human beings on earth like oh you're a cobbler oh you're a you're a manual manual laborer um that means that you are uh, just an aspect of the smith so the smith you know all the little girls worship the yeah. the, the the maid and all the you know uh knights worship the the warrior and it, it's very it's a very convenient religion that makes it very easy for everybody to, um, to to kind of be involved in or have a pull towards a certain character or figure that's presented to you. I I I just think it feels more like the ancient Greek gods, doesn't it? That like as soon as yeah. they need a certain kind of god for something or goddess for something. Zeus sprouts one out of his head or something <laughs> like it's just I mean there could that there, there could be that there is I mean this this obscure theory that I've got of the of a of a religion hiding inside another religion so that it's you're still yeah. able to get the masses to worship but they don't know what they're worshiping because it's dressed up as something else yeah. it could be that what would be the point of that what would be the purpose of that uh, who knows but i think my bold prediction for this area of discussion is that i think there will be a huge secret that relates to faith and religion that we don't know about yet that will definitely be revealed before the end of the series whether that's the seven the faith of the seven being just complete hocus pocus and invented for a particular reason or whether it's that the many-faced god is actually the old gods and the weirwoods mm -hmm. and you know i just think there's there's going to be some real mind blowing oh my god why didn't we see that that relates to this issue of religion i think and and i know we've said it before every time this topic comes up because we could do probably an hour and a half on just this topic but i think it's definitely something maybe in the new year that we should do a stream on maybe elmore or johnny or mackenzie or someone to be interested in joining us because it's so fascinating in this book and it's so interesting when you hear multifaceted as well like it, like you think of there's so many things that go off in my head it's like it, it could be broken it could be splintered it can be uh multi-part it, it it's kind of all confusing but um if you haven't read the septon Marybold 
uh, broken man, Mary Bald, broken man speech in a while. It still holds up as one of the best. I think still for me, though, the best is yet to come with Barristan and Selmy in Winds of Winter. That's my favourite. Mm -hmm. Number one for me. What, what's your number one? Speech. Mm. Broken Man is probably two and, and Septon Maribald is, is number one. Or sorry, Barristan and Selmy is number one. Um, I fire. think the 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 memorable one that stands out for me is the everyone is the Tyrion one where he says, "Let's go and kill these brave men," and it's the yeah. the beginning of the Battle of the Blackwater because it's just so it's just so rousing. Um, well, he's got two. Yeah. He's also got his trial speech yes. as well, which is yeah, great. that's a good one. Uh, a good one. I'm expecting a great one from Sansa in the future. I'd say he's got a good one up his sleeve for Sansa. <laughs> Uh, so is there anything else for Brienne? Uh, there's a couple of little nuggets in this chapter. Uh, the three heads that are t that Heil demands are taken back to Tarly so that they can be mounted on the gate. So you get three heads on the mounted on the gate rather than three heads of the dragon, which I just, <laughs> which, I don't know, it was just a... And also... Um, there's a lot about heads this week, actually. Mm. So we have Vargo Holt's head later on. Ooh. As well as the mention of Stoneheart, which just make me think, I wonder if they'll ever kind of these two factions will run into each other. They do seem to be in the, in a similar vicinity, um, but Stoneheart is mentioned, but also this great pack of wolves, yeah. um, these great like white wolves that are prowling. That um, Nymeria is mentioned, and apparently this huge she wolf devours no other flesh but men's flesh which immediately just makes me think of aria because i don't think aria ki has killed any women or is likely to kill any women cersei's on a list but that just that devours no other flesh but men the wave. uh yeah yeah maybe i mean obviously she did in the tv mm -hmm. show um yeah, but I think I always kind of thought that there was some suspicion about the identity of the High Septon, but I never really thought there might be with Septon Maribald. But this reread, I thought, oh, it seems like potentially it could have been someone significant from that Illuminati. Um, so it's it's how many era. years? How many years is it since he started uh, wearing, going barefoot and a long time, right? Yeah, quite a while. I think at least like. 20 years i think yeah but he's a he's a huge guy like he's really tall he's got massive feet <laughs> he was he was a he was obviously a fighter and a bit of a character um yeah. it's yeah. i i kept trying it kept going around in my head the dog with no name mm. the, uh, it takes him he goes around that area twice a year yeah he has this route yeah. that takes him six months what is the significance if there is any yeah it, it could be that he's actually searching for someone and yeah, just maybe. Keeps going round and round maybe uh, it seems as if he wanted to, if he wanted to spread the word of gods he maybe change the rotation mm. i don't know maybe not um but yeah so the next chapter from brienne will be the quiet isle will it Yes. Yeah. yeah. Which is next week. <gasps> yep. Second chapter next week. Excellent. Yeah. Um, anything else then from Brienne? Uh, no. Uh, pods. Pods remembering his pod remembering his childhood dog, that was named Hero. That's dead, obviously, which just makes me think dead dog Hero, could, so that could be uh, an indication foreshad foreshadowing that Pod will die a hero. Like yes. his dog, yeah. but um, yeah. Yeah, I was thinking. Yeah, uh, sorry. What, when you said about Arya killing a woman, there's every chance she might have to kill Lady Stoneheart. Yeah, every chance. That would yeah. be very bittersweet. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, so uh, then we're on to Sam three, and I, oh, it's funny with some of these chapters. You find oh, we're only on Sam three, and yet we're more than halfway through the book. Anyway, um. So many questions with this chapter. I don't know where to start. Where would we start, Claire? 
Oh, right. Okay. This is what I described earlier as to me, Sam's seminal chapter. So it just, yes. it, it set, it, it, it set uh, time wise right in that, like between night and day. So it's, and it's described as gloaming. So, you know, we call this the gloaming chapter previously, um, which could be depending on how long winds of winter and how long dream of spring and whether or not there's anything after that this could be you know halfway through the series where we're at now or it could just be that this is where things start to really change from night to day um or day to night for several characters and i think there's even a temperature change in this yes chapter. yes yeah, yeah. I, I just i just you know there's lots of like sam's losing weight he seems he's doing this like previously we had lots and lots of reasons of why sam was a craven why he was afraid in this chapter you just get he's too angry to be afraid yeah. he's just going for it um uh, so th things seem very different this is the chapter again lots and lots of theories so this is the chapter where you can see quite easily oh right yeah i can see how people would think sam is the last hero and that he was you know drowned and reborn a bit amidst salt and smoke and you know the fog <clears throat> on the canals in bravos and the salt water and just oh yeah yeah, yeah this is this is sam as, as the last hero um and what he's doing is actually quite heroic um but to, uh, and also just to mention again that there is a mention of Stoneheart much more vaguely but it's Sam wondering about the babies uh, he's wondering when when John's heart turned to stone yes yeah so um well Eamon tells him he does yeah Eamon says you, uh, where where you raised him um, when you raised him up to be uh, to be Lord Commander um mm. so I'm, I'm guessing that's him outright saying you fix the election yeah right yes oh yeah yeah, yeah. i think he knew that yeah um do we, do we know that for sure that, that eamon knows it? no 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 that sam fixed it is this the first time that eamon like that that it's been said out loud sam actually fixed it like that he not just that he nominated john but that he it seems to me he's saying you fixed it you fixed you could it could be or he could just be saying it could just be his way of saying when you all raised him right okay you know, by I, virtue of yeah you know, i just you all uh, got him there i kind of thought oh this is you kind of manipulated it so that he could be lord commander so you've only yourself to blame there's there's a couple of really interesting there's this chapter and the next one as well where Eamon is just descending further and further and there's loads of like little nuggets mm. in the and I think it is the next Sam chapter where there's something about the babies and he mentions Craster which which when you read it you just think you, it, it just it doesn't it doesn't seem to mean anything but when you actually go back and read what he's saying he makes it seem as though either Val and Della were like sister wives of Craster, or that um, Mance was somehow related to Craster. There's something, it's just the way he says it that makes you think, oh. There's something but, with Mance and Craster being like one of those few kind of characters that they're they're not in it that much, but mm. they're mentioned in every single book enough <laughs> yes. for them to be important. <laughs> yeah yeah definitely yeah. definitely uh, i i just i mean there's two bits really for me that there's the there's the bit before sam goes to ragman's harbor and, and finds and tackles darian and then mm. there's the ragman's harbor bit so there's just a couple of things that i want to point out about the beginning bit before he goes to ragman's harbor is that what is it, there's something here for me about Eamon and the wall and his proximity yes, to the wall. Me too. <laughs> yeah, he seems to be not just like, um, you know, he, I know he says this ice preserves, 
but there is, he, do, he seems to be losing his wits and just dying very rapidly. And I don't think it's just because of the journey. I, I mean, it was horrible. This has been an absolutely horrific journey um, a, across the narrow sea, but I he don't think pneumonia as well or something. Yeah, yeah. But I, I think I think uh, he's a hundred and two. <laughs> I just think he, there's something about him not being at the wall, and why I guess is that? Equivalent why to living to like 140 now, right? Yeah, 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 really, yeah, really yeah. hard. Yeah, it is. Is ice here a synonym for the magic of the wall? Like, is ice? Mm. Does ice equal magic? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, uh, and it also made me wonder. So, if he had to go north, as kind of a hot kind of a hot being if you like a hot the hot the targs being hot mm. going towards the wall to be preserved is that why the others are coming south is does it work the other way around uh maybe yeah. i don't know that doesn't really make any sense but i don't know do they need a thaw <laughs> whereas <laughs> the targs need to freeze <laughs> like it's yeah, I, yeah. I don't know it's, there's some kind of the way he there's something to do with the wall maybe they maybe they're going to stop when they get to the wall maybe it, is it could through. it be maybe it's not the wall maybe it's uh maybe it is my Raymond's proximity to blood raven yes that's, that's true been, that's been preserving him like because well, of the targaryen blood or just says maybe Danny will inevitably be drawn towards Blood Raven potentially as well. Yeah. Maybe yeah. if he is repelling the others, Blood Raven. So he might actually, yeah. there might be a push pull towards Blood Raven. The only time that in his kind of ramblings that Maestro Raymond is, is even halfway remotely lucid is when he's talking about dragons. And there seems to be this increasing urgency about the news of dragons that he needs to find out something about what's going on with the dragons. And that's the only time he is compass mentis, is when he's thinking about dragons or talking about dragons. He tells Sam, and Sam gets really confused when he tells Sam that he, he, he saw dragons. Mm, mm. and Sam said you, you were born after the last dragon died so yeah. that's not possible and then he says he sees them in his dreams so he's a dragon dreamer have they called yeah, yeah. so is, is, does he have some sort of connection with Danny I'm going to be watching Danny's chapters very carefully mm. again mm. just to see do they match up chronologically maybe mm. um, there's Eamon seems to know something he, maybe he doesn't realise he knows something, but I feel like there's a, a piece of information there that Eamon knows because it comes back again. He mentions sitting in the inn in Old Town. Mm. And it was mentioned in the last chapter as well. So there's something important about that meeting with Egg and Dunk in that inn. Mm. Something was said or they witnessed something or was there a crossover with Marwyn? something something was said it it came up the last time it was the happiest time of his life was there a transfer of eggs did they give eggs to somebody mm. literal eggs there's something something um maybe yeah um, maybe um, maybe they discovered a new prophecy or something there who knows it, well it, it mm. could be that this is what yeah could lead to uh, Rhaegar of course um the just to, to touch on Darian for a minute um I mean, a bit of a scumbag, let's face it, letting this old man die. And also a bit spendthrifty. He's probably never had this much money in his life. But Darian is the kid that was protested his innocence. He slept with a girl and then the girl's father said it was rape and he was sent to the wall. And I think if, if nothing else, this chapter proves he's innocent. Yeah. Because he marries the prostitute rather than just going to form and raping her, right? Yeah. He, he marries her so that he can sleep with her and not be scummy for the night. He'll be mm -hmm. he'll sleeping with his wife. So um, it, 
it's Darian is a really good example of in this series of where somebody isn't purely bad and isn't pu purely good and is just trying to get what they can out of this short miserable life mm -hmm. um, yeah. and I, I feel for him I really feel for him it's hard not it's like you can see why Sam is furious with him yeah as the reader you can go god Sam if that was you I'd be feeling sorry for you as well like I think you're being scummy but I like considering where you came from with Randall Charlie, I'd be feeling have your night with the prostitute. <laughs> <You know? laughs> <Yeah. laughs> uh, I, I had questions around, and I remember having, like I said, a discussion about this chapter in lots of detail a few years ago about this marriage. This is this marriage um, with the prostitute and Darian. Is it symbolic, or does it mirror? uh something that maybe happened in westeros and i'm thinking mm -hmm. specifically ned because darian says in justification of this ridiculous marriage he's only married for a night even in westeros you don't lose your head for being wed for a day which I'll makes me think if if because ned's beheading was mentioned in cersei's chapter as well there are these little kind of like things that are alluded to well it's it's mentioned in jamie's it's a pretty much yes. Jamie's chapters focus around that. Well, the only person we know so far in Westeros that's lost their head, uh, apart from minor characters who Ned beheaded, um, and Theon, and Theon, yeah, but obviously Ned was beheaded, and he, the I suppose, the Rob was beheaded, wasn't he? he he wasn't killed by beheading, yes. yes. No, but yeah. they, yeah, later on they did, yeah. yeah. But I think, you know, the, 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 this this could play in again, again, theories, theories, theories. These chapters are just crammed with potential theories um, that maybe Ned, you know, if John is Ned's and Ned was married previously, yeah. even if only for a night, um, to legitimise that, that, that child that uh yeah that puts a different spin on even in westeros you don't lose your head for being married for a day well actually you do if you're ned stark it would also because <laughs> the one thing i can't understand why is aemon aemon doesn't seem to have uh, to approve of john being lord commander and seems to suggest mm -hmm. in the times when he's a little bit more lucid that this has gone to john's head mm. you know, while there have been many mad Targaryens, uh, they're not always mad. Um, they don't just lose their head as soon as they get power. Okay. However, Starks often do, especially at the mm. wall. Yes. So is is that why Aemon is against John? If jo say John isn't a secret Targaryen, say he is actually a Stark and a legitimate Stark. Is that why Eamon is worried? Because that's a dangerous thing to have a legitimate Stark at. at in in the in the position of Lord Commander, yeah. yeah. Like, his, if you want history, to history, yeah, history. track record, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, 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 uh, possibly, yeah. Because oh, there's there, so like, many ways. When did it's hard turn to stone, you know. There are so many ways that you can look at. Like there's the there's the surface story of mm -hmm. they're in Bravos, they're trying to get to Old Town. And Eamon is deteriorating, and Darian is a bit of a shit. That's the surface chat. That's the surface story. It's everything else that's underneath that's so rich, and the potential for so many different theories that I can just. Well, yeah, this is also the theory. Like because we're getting Bravos through an adult's eyes, we get a whole different idea yeah. of Bravos. Yeah. So the yeah. idea that the trees definitely don't grow there. Mm -hmm. Um, the the commoners are the ones that peacock. Yeah. Uh, I think Sam even uses that word, right? Yeah. They they wear yeah. all the like the 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 mad textiles and colors and all that kind yeah. of thing. And it's actually the highborn that are very reserved, still yeah. purples and blacks and muted colours. Uh, this doesn't line up with Danny's recollection of of. No, no, it doesn't. It doesn't line up with what what we think of. The highborn sound very reserved. 
it it it, it, it just reminds me of Amsterdam, <laughs> Bra Bravos, and uh, I. I think you're right. It is interesting to see this version through Sam's eyes. It seems a lot bleaker, mm -hmm. whereas there's more of a sense of kind of adventure mm -hmm. through Aria's eyes. You know, there's a there's like a curiosity, whereas it's just kind of fear and oddity that that, that you experience through Sam's eyes. Um, let's, yeah. let's talk about Aria. How mm. excited were you when you first read this chapter? I was so excited. Yeah, unbelievably excited. I remember this it all is, comes flooding back is, when I read yes. it again. It's like, oh. yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like, we could, it can't be, it can't be. Oh, she's going to help him. She's going to, you know, and I don't, because I don't think he ever says to her that he knows John, does he? I mean, he, he had a longer conversation with Bran. Mm -hmm. This is weird, isn't it? Sam has run into Bran. He's yes. run into Arya. And also Brienne has been so close to running in to yeah. Arya, to Sansa, like this, like a... well, there were, there were. I mean, if um, Rick, Rick, uh, what's he called, the little one, Rickon? Rickon, yeah. If he's in Skagos, then Sam floated quite close to the, you Very, know, yeah. to the these um, two characters close. just get to see a lot. Yeah. Um, can I just say, Arya Stark, your little potty mouth. Uh, yeah. <laughs> we never get to see that language from your point of view, you brat. <laughs> Where did she get that language? <laughs> My goodness. Yes, it's funny. It's especially funny to hear Roy Tree say, I'm a cunt. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even know what it means. I don't want to know. I'm guessing they smoke camel. Um, <laughs> uh, but yeah, it's, it's a very... Why doesn't she say anything? She is she already completely into the training? Well, she I, I'm surprised that they did just because of what she said. She obviously knows about the Night's Watch. Yeah. She obviously knows about some of the customs of the Night's Watch and their, you know, what they wear and the the cloaks of the of the you know the Night's Watchmen. And yeah, he doesn't quiz her in like, well, actually, who are you? She, I mean, she gives him a, you know, a, a, a sure story. Well, um, you've ever figured but... it out? I don't think he would have. It was. It wasn't like the brand situation. I don't know if he even knows who Aria is and that she's missing and that John's really. I don't know if he talks about about that much, but does this mean that Sam is going to run into Sansa at some point? Do you think? If he leaves Old Town and does end up somehow trying to make it back up north, he could run into yeah, Sansa. It just, I mean, it just... Um, mm -hmm. Is he likely to run into Reek before that? Which way will he go? Which way will he go? Yeah, probably so. Maybe. Yeah. Um, it's, it's funny because... I all I think Davos as well is kind of one of those characters. Davos, Sam, and Brienne I kind of put in a yeah. separate bubble, but Davos is kind of a very Septon Marybald type figure mm. um, that you can hear. If the broken man speech had been written and Davos had said it, you would have understood it as well. Yeah, we yeah. came from the same place. Um, similar with Sam and Brienne, it kind of doesn't matter for me which of them run into which Stark, which is like, I'll be excited no matter what. Yeah. Uh, although, uh, do you think Sam will ever realize that this was Arya? Do you think there'll ever come a point where he'll look back and go, oh, that girl with the clams. The it, it could be that she's, you know she's taken somebody else's face later on in the story when they get to when she gets to westeros because that's clearly where she's heading oh, at the end of the mercy chapter and nobody knows that it is aria but somehow sam twigs because of what she's maybe she calls somebody a camel cunt or something and he's like oh <laughs> yeah that's so specific to this young girl in it's so unusual it's it's oh, yeah so... it... and we he rarely uses that word so mm. it's like it's very, it really hit me this time going, that is really mm -hmm. weird. Also, it's it's not a language, it's not language you'd expect from a high born girl. 
No. So it really is a good cover for her to use that kind of language. Um, could be, I, yeah. could be. I think I don't know. Maybe he, maybe he, at some point, runs into both Arya and uh, both Sansa and and oh, Rickon and my you dream. know. This is my dream. Is manages to make her way back to Winterfell, and she's sitting by the fire, regaling them with stories of the horrible life at the Dreadfort. And then she slips into the story: the Boltons are a bunch of camel cunts, and they all go, <gasps> "Yes." Sam goes, "Yes." Where are you? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's all it. all along, <laughs> all along, she was. Harrying. George, you can speed yeah. up that chapter. I have written. <laughs> Oh, so Sam's becoming much more capable in this chapter. He's uh, he's getting quite handy with his fists. He's very, um, you know, he's in charge of what happens to this young girl and a baby and this old, very significant Meister from, from the wall. And he's kind of rising to the challenge. Um, this is where things start to change for Sam, I think. This is where his real adventure starts to begin. Can I ask a harsh question? Mm. Not being a mother, having no intention to, of being a mother in the Middle Ages, if this is kind of the late Middle Ages or whatever. Um, uh, when is Gilly going to stop crying? And why is she still crying? And I know it's awful, but this was a child that was never going to survive anyway, right? It was going to be mm. sacrificed to the others. She has seen, presumably seen her sister and mothers and aunts and whatever, deal with grief before of a child mm. it seems like there's something else going on it, 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 maybe it, maybe she knows how significant this child is and yeah. it's the, you know it's the responsibility of um it, it's a pretty crappy situation to be in it's so crappy and, and, and i don't want to finish her point, grief but. the whole point of trying to escape from the misery that was Craster's Keep is so that you can rescue. It's that in mother's instinct to say, rescue, save your child. And she did that and then she lost it because she had absolutely no control about what happened in that situation. No, and I agree. I, and, and, and she's a fucking like, not a subservient Westerosi bend the knee kind of, you know. So this is going to be absolutely crucifying her but i do think that and also her baby was quite gentle when it was feeding and things like that she's got this monster like clamped to her that's just it hurts and it just you know i i think she's going through a horrendous miserable time but maybe it's there very, is something more to it maybe she just, knew how significant th this baby was it doesn't yeah. seem very wildling like mm. The way she's going on and i know the the the, the women at crasters aren't really wildlings in the same sense mm. that Igrit was mm. certainly if Igrit was in this position it would be very different mm. um but Igrit would have been just as out of place out of place in a city like bravos and so basically what you're saying is tough it out girl you're from beyond the wall <laughs> get a grip get a grip <laughs> just just be in the freezing cold with this <laughs> Centenarian and uh, this black crow and the guy that's run off all oh my God, with and, some freaky and, uh, kids that won't stop screaming and biting your nipples. You'll be fine. Come on. <laughs> yeah. Oh, Gilly. Yeah. Oh. yeah, no, I, 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 yeah, I wouldn't make a very empathetic writer, would I? Um, <laughs> Oh, I, well, it is, it I, is maybe there is something extra there. Yeah, it feels, yeah. And, and probably what's compounding the grief is that she can't share it with Sam at this stage. Maybe. I, I think what well, I really enjoyed this chapter again for there are certain chapters where George R. R. Martin's writing really comes alive for me, and there are those chapters where there's having to build an atmosphere. And those chapters where there's that bordering on horror mm. and the description of the fight from Sam's perspective of that fight or flight mechanism was really gripping for me because I have um, 
<clears throat> I know what I'm like in those kind of situations. I meet, I, if somebody comes at me with aggression, I meet them with aggression and I, I hate myself for it afterwards. But that's instinctively the kind of person I am. Okay. I will I will act aggressively. I'll take time to kind of calm down and reflect. And later on, you know, I can deal with it later on. But in the moment, that fight or flight mechanism for me is to fight. And I know how, you know, you you heart rate gets elevated because you're getting kind of ready to either hit someone or run or whatever. And it just it's described that mechanism that physical mechanism that happens mm -hmm. in that moment is described really well in this chapter at, at the beginning of the fight um and also when he when he's in the water and thinking that this is it he's drowning well he can't and um, because i'm definitely not like a physically aggressive person and i don't think sam necessarily is but he loses the war of logic here because darian mm. has him like yeah like sam says you took a vow you took a vow as, like as if darian had a choice not to take a vow mm. as if like he could have just stood there and go do you know what i'm not taking this vow and they go yeah. okay so they will just kill you because you're yeah. a rapist yeah like, it, yeah it's yeah. not it, he wasn't he didn't have an argument to go with and just ended up going with his fists and um, the guy that rescues him um, zando yeah so what are your theories on him or do you have any? Well, I do remember somebody once saying that Zondo sounds like John Doe. <laughs> but, <laughs> um, I think it's interesting that he says that he knows these dragons. Yeah. So he's obviously someone that's been in Danny's presence or maybe he's been in Carth somewhere like that he's a summer islander isn't he yeah i just i want like it, it, as with all things sometimes convenience is an is a a, a factor in mm -hmm. conspiracy so um yeah i don't know i'll be watching him mm. uh so i'm guessing you have a few more things then for sam well, yeah, it, just, it, it is very convenient that he turns up right yeah. now at this time to rescue just when they need safe passage to Old Town. And, oh, yeah. guess where they're going? Um, Does someone need Sam or Amon or Gilly's baby? <sighs> yeah, Does maybe. Marwyn need them? Does I don't know. It's, it's a bit strange the way he just shows up. Maybe this hundredth or thousandth child or whatever has been prophesied throughout different cultures. We know from the world of ice and fire that there are different cultures and civilizations that have very similar um, theories around the, the, the last hero and yeah. Azora High. Yeah. Uh, to, to the point where I just started, like after I've read that in the world of Ice and Fire, it was like, okay, so Azora High is basically Father Christmas or Santa Claus or whatever he's called yeah. in various different like cultures and things. It's like a slightly different version of the same, you know, the same historical person. But uh, Eamon tells Sam to he's talking about songs and he says that they're to find the truth in a song yes which i thought was quite interesting he also knows that he were i think he knew the minute that he left the wall that he wasn't going to see old old town um the you know even despite that horrendous journey across the sea he could have been floated to old town on a you know on a cloud and he still would have been deteriorating the minute that he left the wall so is finding the truth in a song i mean this is because darian was sent with them mm. john thought that if they sent darian and he was singing about the wall people would want to go to the wall mm. Hmm. Has John lost his freaking mind? <laughs> what the hell is he talking about? Who knows? So, is, <laughs> is there some other truth in a song that Darian has? 
Or is there some other truth in Darien? Well, just that all the songs that we hear are, but that have some sort of truth in them, like a lot of the, you know, the things that Mel sees in the flames. It's the inter it's an interpretation that's passed down or interpreted, you know, a bit a bit skew with. Mm. But there is some truth in there as well. Yeah. So that's, um, that's Barbara, the question. Barbara has a good point here. John and Ari are said to resemble. So maybe Sam will think of this resemblance at some point. Yeah, I mean, he's he's a he's a bit like he's hungry. He's worked up. He's cold. He's confused mm. when he meets her. So that kind of automatic sense to question her further probably hasn't kicked in yet. Um, but yeah, she does like she does like Arya's instincts are so good. She gives him free food probably because she realizes he's just hungry, mm -hmm. um, which is you know just speaks volumes about Arya. But um, mm -hmm. yeah, anything else then from Sam? No, I think that's it. So uh, then we move on to Jamie three. And next mm -hmm. week we have two, two Jamie chapters, but Jamie is yeah. um, he's sent towards the towards River Run, and uh, it begins the chapter with Cersei mocking him for his grey beard. Like things are bad between him and Cersei, but all the yeah. time he just keeps thinking of raping her or just having sex with her and. Mm -hmm. He cannot stop thinking about it. Hi, Connie. And hi, AU and Dog as well. I forgot to say hi. To, and um, yeah, I think I said hi to everybody. Um, yeah, so he's just thinking of all these kind of, they're, they, they're less and less alike with every passing day. Um, and this is a broken relationship. There's no way that they're going to be able to continue their sexual trysts. And he keeps thinking about she's been fucking the kettle blacks and moon boy and all that kind of thing and he can't get that out of his head at all and um, but this is also the chapter where he slaps <laughs> uh he slaps a uh, connington isn't it and um, one of the uh, yeah yeah it's yeah. red red run it yeah. yeah for uh dishonoring the lady brienne uh, well so He's a good fit. He's a good mate. So, uh, yeah. Well, here's, here's Jamie uh, defending a maid's honour. So there are some very knightly things about Jamie. Um, <clears throat> I think these two chapters, both of them, Jamie and then we get Cersei is the next chapter. They're very much just leading up to what's going to be happening with Cersei in the coming chapters. So it's just setting the setting things in motion and in this chapter we get I, I think just a real sense I've just got more questions really than anything else um Cersei has sent her consciousness conscience away here um anything that could remind her to be human and have human feelings towards somebody else as she's just thwarted them and sent them away so she not only has she sent her protector like her personal protector a physical bodyguard because he would be there to defend her um against attack she's also sent away the logic yeah 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 I, 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 so so i suppose my question is would jamie have prevented cersei from weaponizing the faith yes well would he have been there to do that though? Because he seems to be guarding Tommen personally more these days than her. He is, but he's around her quite a bit. I mean, in each of their chapters, either she summons him to chastise him for something, or yeah. he's there sort of around trying to find out. I don't know. She, he seems to be around her quite a bit. And then there was the it's, all the the stuff with the funeral and. Because he knows King's Landing so well, he mm. would have known that the numbers had grown around, mm -hmm. that the, the mm. High Sparrow numbers had grown. Um, and I'm guessing those numbers grew even more once he left. Mm. Because I, I assume that that, that, that kind of escalated quickly. Um, yeah. The, the stuff with the High Sparrow. 
and like the bones around Baylor and all that kind of thing. And um, oh. that's the kind of thing, the kind of iconography that you'd imagine the Lord Commander of the King's Guard would find alarming and would mm. want to stop. So mm. um, I'm like the the it's set, it, the sense is that Jamie's gone a few weeks mm. by the time she goes to the High Septon. So you're probably right. He probably he would never have let her go there alone. Um, and she's she's just sending away all the people that she previously found a source of support, but now is just completely paranoid about. Yeah, and. You know everything that she's doing that is just such a misstep for her and securing her position and her son's position everything she thinks she's doing is just a monumental fuck up yet she's kind of see oh you know father would be so proud and you know if only they you know and she she kind of prides herself on being able to read certain situations and it's like but Cersei you've got that so proud. you've got that I can see why you're looking at it that way but no yeah. you've got Actually, that completely wrong it's funny that you bring that up because in Jamie's chapter because I said at the beginning that my overarching theme this week is don't overestimate or underestimate the power of belief um I can't remember who it is Jamie talks to in this chapter and he talks about how there haven't been many lords that have been men of God and Tywin included. Mm, mm. Whoever he's with says that but um, th there's also this idea of the power of the curse of, of Harrenhal mm. and Jamie tells them at um, Harrenhal that Harrenhal is now in the name of the crown until until Lord Baelish comes to claim Harrenhal. And we already know Littlefinger doesn't really want Harrenhal because mm. it's cursed. Mm -hmm. um, he really only wants the power that Harrenhal brings. So does that mean that the curse isn't on Littlefinger now? That it is actually on the crown. It's on Lannister's head, this curse. Yeah. Because he's uh, claimed it. He's put Sir Bonifer in there now, hasn't he? Yeah, but he says it's in the name of the crown, so that to me suggests yeah. that if this curse is a thing to be believed, it's going to follow the Lannister line. Uh, yes, if he's announced it, absolutely. Because yeah, you know, he, he, yeah. he, even if the, I mean, it's just the, the the practical matter is he's been sent to sort out Harrenhal or on his way to, to the Riverlands. Is it, it's like while you're up there, sort out Harrenhal. If Littlefinger's not there to sort out Heron Hall, then Jamie's having to do that in the na in the Crown's name, and um, you, because they're just running around like you know they're like um, Gregor, just horrendous, absolutely horrendous. Like, I forgot about the cannibalism. Oh, making roast goat, but just just. Uh, horrific all of so, it is just horrible. So they, really... they, they cut off Vargo Holt's hands and feet yeah and feed it to him uh, yeah and there was the rest of the men but then also like his ears have gone and his nose have gone. it just just absolutely ugh, it's just horrible but they're doing some weird sinister things up there and really somebody weird. does need to just put some leadership in and sort it out so and that's what Jamie's done but you you're right by doing that he's yeah. kind of t assumed um uh, you know assumed control of the castle so so this is one of the the very sad things about the show is that we lost Ilan Payne as a character because the the, mm. the actual actor died um midway through the ser series two I think um uh so, and and I completely forgot that Ilan Payne is actually has a vital role still in this story mm. mm -hmm. very interesting role um mm. so Jamie has invited him along basically to retrain him. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm guessing also to not be a weapon that can be used by Cersei. There might be a twofold kind of... Third. Yeah, I mean, he's, he Aspects. is the king's justice. So if mm -hmm. he's taking the king's justice, then who will... So seen, you know, she'll find someone, I'm sure, but yeah. there's there's um, no one official there to meet out the king's justice. I hear you said he didn't die. I thought the actor did die. 
he had cancer or something? Maybe, I maybe think he cancer. I think he was really poorly, made a recovery, but uh, he, he didn't, didn't, he didn't go uh, back to the role. Uh, and then, of course, in the TV show, that was taken by. Um, oh, I'm thinking old Nan died, right? The woman that played old Nan died. Yeah, possibly. Yeah, yeah she's from Gavin and Stacey as well. Oh, I know what you mean. Yeah, yeah. Oh, she's she's got a foul mouth in that. Yeah, she's great. <laughs> See, she, she would she could have come back and used that Aria language, no problem. Um, so yeah, so uh, pain, uh, ill and pain. Then yeah. So, so what do you think? There's any um, any significance to his role here with Jamie's chapter? Only in that he's been removed from King's Landing, he's on the road, he can be potentially hanging around the Riverlands at some point, because I don't know what happens to Ill and Payne in the story. I don't think, as we're up to now at the end of Dance with Dragons, that anything has happened to Ill and Payne, he's just there as part of Jamie's camp. But he's on somebody's list, he's on pretty, I think he's one of the first names on in Aria's prayer, in Aria's list. So well, that was my question. Will Aria, will Aria kill Ill in pain in, Riv in the Riverlands? Yeah. Almost certainly. Uh, um, if yeah. there's one person that's going to be on a list as well, if Sansa was to have a list, Ill in pain would probably be on her list oh, as yeah, well. Yeah. yeah. But yeah, yeah, yeah certainly. It's, uh, very quickly, he wanted to leave his position as King's Justice. Kind of a miserable. Mm -hmm. uh, conditions that he's living in in mm. King's Landing he's is there's food rotting in his quarters and like I mean it's not a, a not well, a nice existence you know, no it's not a well rewarded way he's living in the dungeons pretty much he's just existing yeah. he's just existing ill in pain it's not a life he's just existing you can't so, speak that's it my, he, he so who, where's Tyrek that's my question where's Tyrek <laughs> So uh, we asked this before, and I did a, a little kind of uh, reading online cause when when I saw this during the week. So there are there's a few theories out there, but one of the big ones is that Varys is hoarding um, heirs, that he's kind of taking heirs to replant when they've put Aegon on the throne. Have you heard this theory? No. Yeah, that that, that he has uh, uh, Lannister. Um, who else did he have? Oh shoot, now it's gone over my head. He has a Lannister. He has uh, completely gone over my head. Does he have a Tyrell maybe or something? But yeah, so th th yeah. this is one of the theories, but I don't know. Um, okay. Jamie seems to think that it's Varys, that Varys had something to do mm. with his disappearance. Mm -hmm. Now, I think somebody said when they were writing up their theory, so they could be saying anything, that George said that we will see Tyrek again or that he will be mentioned again. He's mentioned in every single book. <laughs> okay. <I ain't> missing. <laughs> so, there's every, so it suggests that he's important, right? Yeah. yeah. The bread rights happened in clash quite early in clash mm -hmm. and, he's and he was 14 there. he was he either was 14 at the time or he is 14 now but yeah well the way lannisters are falling he might be very important mm. so any any theories in the chat where is tyrek lannister or who has him um I while, think we're, while we're thinking little... sorry go on it's either Oh no, sorry, it's either Varys or Littlefinger. The other theory I read, which was horrible, is that L Littlefinger gave him to um, that paedophile guy that was in that last chapter. What's his name? Oh, oh uh, Royce. No, is not Royce. Um, um, ah, damn it. Oh my God. It, well, it, I'll tell you. It was. Anyway, that, 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 that's the... Because he says in Francis chapter that you pay so and so can't think of his name Corbray. thank you Corbray yeah. with gold and boys yeah yeah I Good. think that's a bit far-fetched and also Tyrek would be quite old now mm. and Corbray the suggestion is that it's quite young boys Ty Tyrek could, would be, well, would be like almost a man now if this rather than gold and 
boys. He could have a golden boy. Oh. Well, maybe. Yeah. Horrible. Um, yeah. Tyrell left not to be married to a baby. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah which is understandable. Yeah. Thanks, what Barbara. do you think about the... There is a vow that Jamie thinks about that he made yeah. to Kat about, and he mentions this to Cersei. He made the vow never to take up arms again against a Stark or a Tully. Mm. But well, but he, he does do that though, doesn't he, in the Riverlands? Yeah. He so, does. so does what does that does mean? Does he though? Mean? He doesn't actually fight them. He tries to use his words. He does make threats. I guess it depends on what, how technical we get on the definition. I can't remember what happens there. Are we just left? Well, we'll get straight. The last into time, the last happen. time we see Jamie is in the is in camp, isn't he? And Brienne turns up, and he's like, "Oh my god, I never thought I'd see you again." And and then he goes off with Brienne, and that's the last we hear from him. Yeah. So maybe, and I know there's a lot of Jamie chapters later on in this book where, or maybe it's in Dance where. Uh, Edmure is kind of rolled out every day and I think he is trying to kind of broker some sort of peace but maybe if anyone in the chat can let us know so far in the story as we know currently has Jamie kept that vow as yet never to take up arms against him technically it? he has because he can't mm. he can't mm. personally he, phys he physically can't take up arms mm. so he could like get out of it like that but yeah he also has he also which vow came first i mean his vows at kingsguard came first mm. but now the question is is he operating as a kingsguard is he operating as a lannister so Mm. I think Cersei has forced him out of his... Well, in the TV show, where we're up to in the TV show, which is very different, he's leaving King's Landing and leaving Cersei, but he seems to be like, he's a, he's got his own agenda, he's like more of a rogue agent. Yeah, yeah. doesn't he even like take his cloak off or he covers his hand or something? He dyes so his he's, hair. Yeah. yeah, so he's like incognito um, rogue agent, so I don't know. Connie says he'd take up arm... Yeah, he's got his little golden <laughs> cup, his, his hand that can... Um, yeah, was there anything else in Jamie? No. I'm ready for Cersei. Let's get on to Cersei, the mad bitch. <laughs> um, she is mental. She's mental. Uh, I mean, the, like, when you're right, like, George must have great fun writing her. Because it's just like, just throw anything in there. She, she just everything all over the place. Her thoughts are. Um, before we get into, however, that, I don't know. however, she's just 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 to put this into context. I know she's a crazy bitch, but she has just lost her father, and hormones. Maybe this is the yes. second time now mm -hmm. that that you know if she's pregnant. The dress was described as being tight. Last chapter, it was just the dress was tight, and the dressmakers were blamed for it. It must be their fault. It can't possibly be Cersei putting on weight. Here, it was described as being around a middle, that yes. specifically the Very dress was tight around the middle. So yeah. it sounds like she's pregnant. So mm -hmm. I, I I don't know if you heard this at um, at WorldCon. Uh, George R. R. Martin um, said that brand chapters are are the most difficult to write, which I always thought yes. they would be. Yeah. Once yeah. the powers came into it, I mm -hmm. think it's a matter. It's only a matter of time before we stop seeing brand chapters. Yeah. Yeah. It's not possible. I don't mm -hmm. think. Um. But Cersei chapters fun. I'm sure. Great fun. And thanks, Claire, for the heads up that Worldcon is in Ireland next year. Yeah. yeah. I'll be definitely going to that. I'm going to try and set my challenge a challenge for myself. Ivan and myself were talking about it to read as many of the Hugo nominees as possible. Oh wow! Yeah, yeah. I don't know how yeah. I'm gonna do that. I'll try. I'll try. Um, <laughs> I don't think winds will be out to distract me. Uh, so uh, yeah. So uh, I have a question: Is it a red flag that just the way Cersei approaches most things and is wrong about most things? 
Is it a massive red fa flag that Cersei is so convinced that the Tyrells killed Joffrey? Is that suggesting that there was somebody else involved? And my question here is, Tywin, <laughs> did Tywin kill Joffrey? Yeah. Because um, yeah. it's just, she's so convinced by it that it just, it's all, it's almost convincing me that they weren't as in, they weren't well, either, either involved at all or the leaders in the, in the conspiracy that we think they were. We've talked about this before though, haven't yeah. we? Yeah. His reaction to, uh, to Joffrey's death was very strange, very kind of like, oh, get over it. You know, the boy's gone and just like, it, it, he was, to the, he just seemed, he wasn't very shocked at all. Um, and it almost seemed as though he knew it was coming. So, yeah, it really wouldn't surprise me. I think he's just thought, I, I look, you know what? I've not come this far to have the family name ruined by some fucking scrope like, like Joffrey, who's just going to ruin everything. And he would have done, he would have done. Well, whereas, again, whereas he's looking at Tommen and like, okay, this is someone who's more moldable, compliant. And yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, so no, it there is a theory me. out there that it wasn't the wine, it was the pie that killed him and yeah. that Tywin was actually trying to kill Tyrion. Um, and that, oh. that, that was, that was the, so that kind of makes sense as well. Cause he does, well, actually, yeah, choke, yeah. He does actually eat the pie. Mm. And choke. Um, but, but it wouldn't surprise me if it was Tywin's, Tywin was trying to take out Tyrion. If the Tyrells weren't involved because I mean, we said this as well, that Marjorie, if, if it was the wine that was poisoned, Marjorie could have very easily been poisoned unless she knew about it and knew not to drink. But um, either way, I feel like the two things that affect Cersei the most, especially her psych psychological health and well-being, are the death of Joffrey and then the de death of Tywin shortly afterwards mm -hmm. and if she was to find out like she's already going to be broken after the shame thing but if she ever finds out that it was actually tywin that did it i mean i don't know what will happen like there'll be some serious psychological damage there like she will completely that's when he'll 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 find it difficult to write a pov for her yeah, it'd yeah. be like those final cat moments where it's just completely broken and fragmented because that's they're the they're two things they're the two driving forces in her Joffrey and Tywin. Um, interestingly, she's wearing white to go see the High Septon. Mm. So I guess the morning is finished. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, it's officially over. Yeah. Officially over, and um, she has to walk part of the way, which is kind of dangerous. She's putting herself in a bit of danger there, I feel. Um, it's very creepy, this whole scene. Um, the bones stacked up. Uh, I mean, there are great points here. Uh, they are, the crown is supposed to defend the faith of the seven. And yet it is people from either the, in under the crown um the, the people that work for the crown or people that were working for the crown or whatever they're the ones that are raping and pillaging sets mm -hmm. up and down the country yeah and the crown hasn't lifted a finger to help mm -hmm. so it's not surprising that people are bringing bones and you know piling them up here. yeah it's a protest isn't it um, and it's a, it's a very overt pro protest mm -hmm. Um, and the fact that she didn't, I mean, we've had right up into this chapter, lots of uh, inferences about these sparrows. There's this been this mounting sense of something's happening with the swelling massive numbers of the, the faithful that are swarming. You know, you're going the wrong way. You're going down the wrong way down the King's Road. No, they're all heading to King's Landing. Um, and... She's, I don't know, she, it's the way her brain works. She kind of gets almost there to an extent, like she does this risk assessment in her head. No, 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 don't show you blade. Don't don't provoke them. Don't, you know, we will get crucified. Just look at the numbers. 
um, if they wanted to, they could just squash us. Remember the bread riots, remember, you know, so she's been quite sensible when it comes to her own personal safety. But, and she thinks she's very clever in being able to figure that out. Um, but at the same time, she just doesn't, she doesn't get, she's not very savvy when it comes to things like, it's very clear that everyone is closing in on her for money. The faith want, I mean, what is it? Almost a, th a million dragons is owed to the yeah. faith. Yeah. Um, and she clearly owes the Iron Bank and just dismiss them. Probably a lot more. Very, very Bank. contrite, but just dismiss them completely. Um, so there's, the, the, you know, it's, yes, she's got every right to feel paranoid because these forces are closing in on her. But she seems to think that this, she just walks into this deal with the high sept and he must have just thought, wow, that was yeah. so easy. Before we get to the deal, I'm a bit confused about the economics here. So mm. they owe 900,000 to the, 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 the faith. Um, and yet Tywin was gift, gifting crystal skulls, or crystal skulls, crystal crowns mm. to the previous septum. Um, and and then we have Cersei reusing, recycling old dresses. Is that her reliving her youth? Or is it that they can't afford to buy more dresses? It well, seems... remember with, with Tywin, a lot of it was about for show, wasn't it? Yeah. We must not, the people must not see that we remember with the preparation for the wedding, for the yeah. for, for Joffrey's wedding, completely opulent over the, oh, totally over the top, contrasting with all of the, the stories in King's Landing relating to people starving and not having any, any food, and, and yet they're, having, they're putting this on for show. But for, for Tywin, it's important that people think, again, it's like that, you know, power resides where people believe it reside, resides. I think... It was, yeah, there's, you know, so he would get a crystal crown for the high septum, yeah. probably all he could afford, but it was that that gesture, that opulent gesture. Yeah. It's interesting that Cersei's kind of rounding up what she thinks the debt is, but the high septum knows precisely what the number, no, 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 it's 967,000, you know, yeah, okay, round it up to almost a million. After she's done the deal, it's like, oh, yeah, you know, I've just saved the crown, uh, um, a million. Barbara made a great point here. <clears throat> I think Tywin was too superstitious about him being cursed for killing family members to actually order Tyrion or um, to actually order Tyrion or Joffrey's murders, mm. but he probably knew about the pro plot to poison Joffrey. I agree. Um, I think he definitely knew. Um, either way, I I kind of would go with the Tyrion angle if he thought Tyrion wasn't actually his son, which is the last thing he says mm. to Tyrion. Mm. So in that sense, he might kill him. But then Connie mentions guest right, so maybe he doesn't want to breach guest right either. Mm. Um, again, I think if there was any plot on Tyrion on Tywin's part, it was either to kill Tyrion or to ignore the plot. Against yeah, Joffrey. just kind of enabling yeah. it, co-signing it, not necessarily, you know, creating it, but, but if, just, if, I think he just Cersei saw that, that this would that make my knew. life easier. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Cersei yeah. finds out that he knew and ignored it, that will be a big, yeah. big, big yeah. deal. Um, so, yeah, so then we have um, a lot of talk about Ned Stark, as you mentioned earlier on. Mm. Uh, and these, I guess this is where a lot of and we get that to whole talk with Merriweather before she goes to see him that there's no name he doesn't have any name he's common born and um, he's been raised up into this position the crown doesn't get a say in it really and um, although Cersei tells us over and over again she got rid of the last guy so she can easily get rid of this guy and um, Merriweather's I, I don't trust Merriweather at all very very dodgy character um, but she kind of doesn't quite understand the rules around all of this yeah. um uh, so these are this is where kind of because there's so much talk about ned i guess or allusion to ned this is where the howland reed is the high sparrow come 
that those theories well he seems right? to take extreme exception he says that the the sept of Baylor was befouled by execution yeah that's pretty strong i mean why would he be that bothered about it you know there's plenty of other things for him to be bothered about like you say the slaughter of septons up and down the, the country um that the crown seemed to be doing bugger all about that that's you know but it, yeah um yeah why even bring that up why make such a big deal it was befouled by execution uh, it, it, i can completely see where those hell and reed is the high septon theories come from also it's the way he's treating the other septons that they're down on their knees scrubbing the floor mm. and that's something that you wouldn't expect somebody to do to their fellow clerics i guess yeah. um, although it is reminiscent of the faceless men isn't it mm, a little bit yeah, yeah. work yeah. like spiritual practice through work almost there mm -hmm. is that kind of notion in the house of black and white yeah quite a duty yeah yeah duty and suffering and struggle is mm. all a part of it um but yeah, he, he is, I don't really have any theories as to who he is. I kind of feel like it doesn't matter. I don't know if it has to be anyone. Well, whoever it is has weaponized the faith. That's which the is big thing. That, that they, they, that, and that is a pretty clever trick to pull off in that situation. So maybe it, maybe it is, uh, maybe, maybe he is just, the high septon raised by the sparrows and this feeling of you know who represents the small folk and there is you know here's here's one person who potentially could be representing the small folk but he's very he uh, he's very consumed by the uh this notion that the crown must defend the, the faith and that it hasn't uh now whether or not he's just using that as a excuse me as a very good excuse for create basically creating a massive army that would i mean if you're on the outskirts of all this and you're a stark supporter or you're from the north and you're a bit of a mysterious character and you can nobody really knows who you look like or where you live because they can't find it um then yeah maybe you could plant yourself in this position and from the inside out bring down the institutions that are responsible for everything that's wrong with the, the whole continent yeah. um so I, that that would be but i don't know it just seems to it feels it like just seems are, very convenient <laughs> it feels like there are forces working mm. to make whatever war is going to come a sectarian one uh, not just like one between magical forces or political forces, but also sectarian forces as well. Everybody's trying to get yeah. their, everybody's trying to get their tribe on board before yeah. everything goes tits up, basically. Um, so again, I feel like this comes back to like with the Septon Marybold thing, not having a central theology that you can pin your faith on. It's the same with the faith of Rolor. They don't have one thing that they can go back to. It's the same with the faceless men. If you go rogue, there's no one there really to, there's not one principle there to kind of bring you back. It seems to be open to interpretation and that's quite dangerous. The only place that doesn't seem to happen is with the, the old gods, the weirwoods. There seems mm. to be a very, very strong kind of universal principle there that isn't open to interpretation. It is what it is, and that that's it. It's very simple, you know. Um, but the the other ones it, seem complicated. Mm, concept of duality again, isn't there? Monarchy versus the faith, ice and fire. Um, you know, the old gods and the new gods, and that there is this there is this strange duality. Um, I've got to mention it, the because I am trying to pinpoint when these references are made. But when they enter the inner sanctum, there are a, there are a number of twinkly candles there that are reflected underneath, reflected by the seven gods, which is very symbolic. 
because mm. funnily enough guess the number yes there's a thousand of them so oh no one a thousand a thousand twinkly candles right there by the seven gods wow. so is this blood raven witnessing everything is this a reference to the old gods and the new gods mm. it does i don't know uh, 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 this duality again who knows maybe that maybe it is something about these two religions one well, hiding the other it wouldn't be, it wouldn't surprise me at all if blood raven is interfering with cersei because the way she celebrates like she gets out of there thinking she's won Mm. Like she gets out there thinking, oh, I got away with that, and all I gave him was his army that doesn't have to answer to anyone but him. I mean, this is perfect. And she also, in the same vein, thinks that the gold she's just saved would build a thousand sets. Yeah. So that so it's actually mentioned that number is mentioned twice in this chapter. It's almost like the old gods are running into the new gods in this chapter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's true. Um, mm. She also meets Marjorie near the woods and kind of almost threatens Marjorie in her own head and starts laughing at it. Mm. Um, I feel like she's going to slip up. I think this well, is the beginning yeah. of the Mad Queen, right? This, this is like her openly... She's she's so close to verbalizing the threats in her mind. Yeah. Very dangerous. Well, we have to have considering what happens to her, we know what's happened, but particularly with the walk of shame. There has to be that that payoff when we get to it. Is all these chapters building up, the Cersei chapters of her being the lioness and the pride and the, she is just she's being beautifully built up very quickly with Jamie being taken out of the picture so she's very vulnerable she's got everyone closing in on her all these debts and everything she thinks she's do, making these amazing decisions she's got she's surrounding herself by sycophants slash spies like Mer like Tenor, uh, Merriweather, who's telling her, oh, the brilliance of the Queen Regent, how on earth, how could we survive without you making these amazing decisions? So she's walking on air at the moment. That has to be there for us to really feel that pull yeah. when when the Septon, that's, the, that's, that's my favourite bit in the entire series that we're coming to. I thought it was this chapter actually. And I was looking to see how long the chapter, no, it's not going to be this chapter, no, this isn't the one, but it must be the next Cersei chapter. One one word, just one word, and it's that moment when he says that one word to her and it just all changes, it all changes for her. But we have to have that payoff. So we have to have her floating around, making these ridiculous decisions, being all prideful and entitled and lioness of lannister and she's yeah it just has to be that way um, they're, they're yeah. fun chapters because um it's the only time with the exception of danny that we actually really get inside the mindset of somebody who's in yeah. power yeah. and yeah. she's crazy and who has <laughs> been in power for a while right because when we meet danny first she's no power but cersei has had power for a long time really um but yeah Anything else with Cersei's chapter? No, just that she sent all her support away and she's surrounded yeah. by herself by people who she thinks she can control. Well, she's she making she so many mistakes. Yeah. yeah. So then we came to the Reaver chapter and full disclosure, Claire and myself didn't get much from this chapter. <laughs> no, no. I, in fact, I missed the last few minutes, actually. Um, yeah. yeah. Uh, I, I mean, it's just you're on mad. Uh, there's a definite suggestion here that Euron doesn't really like the Ironborn. Mm. Um, that he's using them because he has to use them. Mm -hmm. uh, I think if Euron had had any other option, he would have used it. Um, Damp hair goes missing in this chapter. He completely rejects the results of the King's Moot, uh, believing that the, the sound of the sea, some enchantment, 
uh, blocked out the sound of the sea and the actual intentions of the drowned god, which is so convenient when your religion he didn't, he, doesn't he give just, you the answers you want. Yes, you that's blame true. That's everyone true. else. Yeah. But this is this character. It's like you said before. He he is a he is that archetypal broken man. Mm -hmm. But unlike Septon Marybold, who has embraced reality to a fairly large degree, Aaron has just completely invented and hit and they're almost hidden in uh, it, this is why he's so dogmatic and so pious is because he's just replaced that pain and trauma that he had previously with something else but this I, is something he feels he can control I and it's it, yeah i think aaron is going to do something epic i think he is <laughs> going to be i think something epic is coming because the way Euron throws his way around, the way Victorian throws his way around, mm -hmm. the way Theon and Asha, well, not Theon so much now, but mm -hmm. I feel like Dampere, there he inspires a lot of confidence in people. And mm -hmm. even where people think he's nuts, they, mm -hmm. there's something about him that is captivating, even for Victorian. Um, mm -hmm. I, um, I'm interested in... We'll, we'll talk about the dusky woman in a second, but this chapter ends with Victarion talking to Euron. Uh, Euron asks Victarion to bring the Iron Fleet to Danny and bring Danny back to Euron as, so he can marry her. And as he's talking, as soon as he starts talking to Euron, uh, he clenches his fists and blood starts to drop from his hand. As soon as he starts talking to him, and by the time he's finished talking to him, his hands are just all cut from clenching in anger so much. Mm. First of all, I'd, I'd love to know how he's getting his nails that strong, Claire. Mm. Uh, what base coat is he using? Nail takes formula yeah. two. <laughs> <laughs> um, hashtag not sponsored. Um, but like, what the, what yeah. did Euron do to him? Yeah. That that's, like he, he thinks about Euron dishonoring the, the Lord's, uh, Euron is very calculated in in raising up certain lieutenants of rival groups, so that he's he's taking away the lieutenants of anyone who who's um, against him. Mm. He's very um, there's something about that visceral moment with the blood. It's like I know that it's the, is this just the wife thing because you you killed your wife because of him? What? Like how do you how can you still if the if your anger is that great, how can you still not hear him in the face? <laughs> well, it, it is the thing about Victorian, even though he throws his weight around and he's he's built like a brick shit house, as yeah. my mum would say. Yeah. Um, he's definitely built for fighting, not thinking. Mm -hmm. But he is also obedient. He was obedient Very to Balon. He's kind of arguing with Aaron about he doesn't like it but he's kind of feeling that he has to abide by the king's move decision yeah well he does seem to have if he if he lives by one rule at all it's mm. thou shalt not kingsley yes so, um, yeah and kingsley. But he, he also i mean if that and there's there's more than a than a hint that euron somehow abused damp hair when they were all younger yeah. um I, I, maybe Victorian didn't escape from that either. So he's psychologically tortured by this brother. But even though he's a big physical character, that he can't, he, he can't, he can't, he just can't do it. But so he's, he's it's almost like self harm. He's hurting himself because he, that's the pain he wants to inflict. But he can't because of this childhood. I, was, trauma. I actually wondered: Did he try to get damp hair, or did he try and get? Did Euron try to get Victorion to take part? Yeah, maybe. As an it abuser. Just... Maybe he didn't do anything, but maybe he let it happen. Because he doesn't think too badly of Aaron, of Damper, Victorion. He doesn't think nastily about him. Mm. Um, and to the point where I don't really think he confronts his uh, feelings about Damper, it's almost like he keeps him 
guard it blocked off in some way um it feels like he's denying some truth there or blocking something out with yeah. him as a yeah. brother mm. unlike euron um very very visceral reactions to euron and obviously the stuff with his wife is is going to play, play a big part there but um mm -hmm. so i guess the big thing the big kind of uh conspiracy theory <laughs> if you like is the dusky woman um i'll uh yeah. we i i think i think it's victorian who says that euron's gifts were always poisoned or are always poisoned mm -hmm. and it certainly seems like this woman might be um there's something not quite right well, about her <clears throat> where does he get his grayscale because it's it's grayscale is in fact is with, with isn't it isn't yeah, it grayscale victorian yeah isn't great isn't he infected with grayscale with his wound on his hand oh, and then and then later on the the the, the priest the red priest like burns oh, it burns grace. his hand so he has this i thought it was i thought the wound got or maybe it's just that I it thought it was some infected. magic on it infected the wound more. No, or it kept the wound open. No, was it maybe I, I can't remember. I know that they had a meister that couldn't fix it, and then the the red priest came and kind of I don't know, like cauterized it somehow. It was this like burning fist. Um, but I thought it was the beginning of the beginnings of grayscale or am i thinking of something else i can't remember but it was just where 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 that came where that infection came from whether it was grayscale or something else so was it the it seems like the tyrells that he was fighting at the beginning of the yes. chapter yeah but also when we first meet the dusky woman she's washing his wounds with vinegar, some vinegar solution or something, but could that actually be making it worse? I think it's making it worse. It's kind of, it reminds me of, um, oh, what's her name? Uh, that kills Drogo. Um, Meiji. Oh, Miri Mazdor. Miri Mazdor, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, kind of, she's, I get that kind of vibe off her. That could be a literal thing if it's like, if she's making it worse or, or, or in, indeed if it could be a poison that she's like uh, you know that she's applying to him then literally euron's gifts are poisoned she bleeds him later as well right later on in, the, in dance i think i think she bleeds victorian it feels like she could be using because he has king's blood so could mm. be used for some magical forces bubba says that just the dusky woman is a spy and euron was going to kill her because she can probably read and write. Um, that's a big no-no on the silence, similar to mm. the membership in Barry's Boys and Girls Club of the Greater King's Landing. So, mm. yeah. Um, so Barbara says, or sorry, Connie says, well, I'm getting lost now. Uh, Connie says, is Dusky a plant? Um, mm. And that no, Victorian took it in battle. On a boat and like cut him with a sword a worthy opponent he said yeah that's right yeah you're you're totally right connie um barbara says no he's just cut in battle john connington was the great was the great scale yeah um so yeah so definitely the dusky woman is someone to watch is she somebody that we may know already there, i've seen theories out there that mm. i don't know how people get to these theories I really I like this is my third time reading Feast and I don't know how people get to these theories. Uh, somebody said that she's Masande's mother. How do they even know that? How do you get how do you get there? Um uh, and somebody else um uh, I was looking up and they said that Euron is warging her. But warging is for wolves and dogs. <laughs> so I guess they mean skin changing. I have no idea. But anyway, there are some strange familiarities in there. I, I, I mean, I do. I have heard that theory before that Euron was somehow like Blood Raven's apprentice before, yeah. like Green Sea and apprentice before um, Bran. And he, there's a couple of things like he says. Um, Dog says she's a secret Targaryen. <laughs> yeah, he talks about uh, when he summons Euron and he says, "As a boy, I dreamt I could fly." Oh, she's R. Kelly. <laughs> that sounds very much like 
brand though, doesn't yes. it? As a boy, I dreamt I could fly. Um, and then Victorian asks him, <clears throat> what do you want? And he says, the world. I, I just... Also, that idea that when Bran dreams, he's, his mm. third eye gets plucked out. Yes, yes, like, and he's talking about... Did Euron try to do something with his eye? That... Maybe, oh, yeah, possibly, yeah. could have been. But he's drinking the shade of the evening to open, you know, drink it, brother, to open your eyes. Yeah. So maybe something happened with him when he was younger, when he was a young boy, it didn't work out, he got ousted from the cave or whatever and he's just desperately trying to get back there by using some sort of magical means of doing it because he does seem to be collecting like magical people yeah and uh, victorian seems to be collecting all sorts of weird people when we get into dance as well mm. he's got that weird uh relor priest that actually the dusky woman really doesn't like there's something about her hissing at him um i know there's something made me wonder was she a sand snake or something to do with the sand snakes as well um but i guess she could be just a dusky woman <laughs> there's there's something there's massive sibling rivalry there i think or something deeper and darker than that between victorian and euron these were the two main male contenders for the seastow chair and the king's moot decided that it would be Euron. So, of course, obedient Victorian abided by that decision. But I think there's something burning inside him that has to be, this is, you know, everything he's doing at the moment, he's very aware that this mm. is this is for him, it's for his victory, it's not mine, but I need, I need to have my, own, yeah, yeah, I need to have my victory over him. And so, you know, who knows what's gonna happen there. Um, I mean, if I was Danny, I mean, the choice, mm. your honor, Victorian. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Still my beating heart. <laughs> um, good luck with the dragon, Victorian. Uh, I, I'm, you know, there are people out there that are big Victorian fans and think that he'll ultimately take the Iron Throne. Um, I don't think so, <laughs> but maybe I'm wrong. Uh, yeah. So I, I, the only other thing that the you know, Roderick the Reader, Euron is definitely keeping him around for a reason. Um, yeah. He's pushing it, yeah. you know, with the slave talk and all that kind of thing. Say, so, you know, it's telling Euron we don't do slaves here and questioning things that he's doing. It's not really what I would be doing if I was around Euron, but there you go. Um, yeah, so that's it for me now with the Reaver. I didn't have very much at all. No, 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 me neither. I think it gets a bit more interesting later on with the monkeys and things yeah, like that. But, yeah. Uh, you know, we've only got three weeks now and then feast done. We'll be on to dance. Done, three, done. Just three, three to, weeks. I have the schedule handwritten out. I need to type it up. But um, okay. we start with Jamie. Oh, you said there was a yeah, oh, just three so weeks left. So yeah, we'll, we'll be back to Ireland. I haven't been we'll home be, in February. We'll be done. Um, yeah, day after payday, 16th. <laughs> yeah. So, um, who have we got? So we've got, did you say two Jamie so chapters? next week we have, where's my list? Next week we have Jamie 4, Brienne 6, Cersei 7, Jamie 5, and Cat of the Canals. Oh. So sorry. I'll be wearing my Cat of the Canals t-shirt, finally. I've got a ch cat chapter. Yeah. There we go. All right, folks. Thank you so much for joining us in the chat and for all your theories. And Claire, thank you so much. And we will see you uh, next week. Uh, be sure to go and check out Johnny. Obviously, you all know who Johnny is, but he's got some great streams coming up this week. Thanks a million for watching. Bye. Bye.